Introduction and Preface of Wilderness, a Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Wilderness, a Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. Introduction and Preface introduction by dorothy canfield had jesting pilot asked what is art he would have waited quite as many centuries for an answer as he has for the answer to his question about truth for art to the artist and art to the rest of us are two very different things art to the artist is quite simply life his life of which he has an amplitude and intensity unknown to us what he does for us is to thrill us awake to the amplitude and intensity of all life our own included and this is a miracle for which we can never be thankful enough this at least is what rockwell kent's alaska drawings and alaska journal do for me they take me away from that tired absorption in things of little import which makes up most of our human life and make me see not an unreal world of romantic illusion that fool's pleasure given by the second-rate artist but the real wonder world in which i live and have always lived they make me see suddenly that there is a vast deal more in the world than embittering and anxious preoccupations that much of it is fine much is comforting much awe-inspiring much profoundly tragic and all of it makes up a whole so vast that no living organism need feel cramped no other of the qualities of the journal and drawings goes home to me more than the unforced authenticity of the impressions set down by this strong and ardent artist emerson's grandeur is infinitely more convincing to me because of his homeliness and i feel a perverse yankee suspicion of those who deal in sublimities only the man who can extract the whole quaint savour out of that magical prosaic humorous moment of human life the first stretching yawn of the early morning that man can make me believe that i too see the north wind running mightily athwart the sky and the artist who can put into the simplest drawing of a man and a little boy eating together at a rough table in a rough cabin all the dear solidity of family and human life with its quiet triumph against overpowering nature that artist can make me bow my head before the sincerity of his impressive night the homeliness of the diary its courageously unaffected naturalness how it carries one out of fussy complications to a long breath of relief in the fewness and permanence of things that count and the humour of it sometimes deliciously unintentional like the picture of the artist finishing a fine drawing setting the beans to soak bathing in the bread-pan and going to bed to read a chapter of blake sometimes intentional and shrewd like a banana peel on a mountain top tames that wilderness or colds like bad temper and loss of faith are a malady of the city crowd sometimes outright and hearty like a child's joke as in the amusingly faithful portrait of the pot-bellied self-important personality of the airtight stove there are only three human characters in this quiet intense record all of them significant and vital first of them is the artist himself who in these notes written originally for the eyes of his intimates only speaks out with a free unselfconsciousness as rare in our modern world as the virgin solitude of the island where he lived here is the artist at work creating as henry james said he could not be shown the artist that is a man violently alive full-blooded and fine fierce and pure arrogant and tender with an elate boastful well-founded certainty of his strength rejoicing in his work in his son 
in his friend in the whole visible world and most of all in himself and his own vigorous possibilities for good evil and creative work the other two human characters in this adventuring quest after great and simple things are acquisitions to be thankful for also the touchingly tender-hearted knight-like beautiful funny little boy and lovable dignified old olson a fiction writer wonders in despair why old olson so vividly brilliantly lives in these unstudied pages solid breathing warm as miraculously different from all other human beings as any creature of flesh and blood who draws the mysterious breath of life beside you in the same room fox island lives too we walk about it treading solidly loving every log and rotten stump gnarled tree every mound and path the rocks and brooks each a being in itself just as little rockwell does and we climb with the two younger ones up the sheer snow-covered ridge till across the great jagged teeth of fenris the wolf we see the glory of the open sea we look up at olson swaying gigantic on the deck above us as we bump the side in our little boat and we go down into the warm cabin full of the fumes of cooking and good fellowship and drink with the old skipper and the old swede till we too see deep under the white hard surface of where life is hidden all this firm earth gives authority and penetration to the shining beauty which pervades the book and the drawings carries us along to share it not merely to look at it to feel it not merely to admire it the notes here published were written i believe day by day for the author's wife and children and are here published almost as they were set down as commentary to the drawings well let us be thankful that we were let into the family circle and along with them can spend six months in the midst of strength and beauty and tenderness and fun and majesty close to simple things great because they are real the author may be sure that we leave them with the same backward-looking wistfulness he feels and with the same gratitude for having known them dorothy canfield preface by rockwell kent most of this book was written on fox island in alaska a journal added to from day to day it was not meant for publication but merely that we who were living there that year might have always an unfailing memory of a wonderfully happy time there's a ring of truth to all freshly written records of experience that whatever their shortcomings makes them at least inviolable besides the journal a few letters to friends have been drawn upon all are given unchanged but for the flux of a new paragraph or chapter here and there to form a kind of narrative the only possible literary accompaniment to the drawings of that period herein published the whole is a picture of quiet adventure in the wilderness above all an adventure of the spirit what one would look for in a story of the wild northwest is lacking in these pages to have been further from a settled town might have brought not more but less excitement the wonder of the wilderness was its tranquillity it seemed that there both men and the wild beasts pursued their own paths freely and as if conscious of the wide freedom of their world molested one another not at all it was the bitter philosophy of the old trapper who was our companion that of all animals man was the most terrible for if the beasts fought and killed for some good cause man slew for none deliberately i have begun this happy story far out in resurrection bay and again dropped its peaceful thread on the forlorn threshold of the town we found fox island on sunday august twenty fifth nineteen eighteen and left there finally on the seventeenth of the following march r k arlington vermont december nineteen nineteen End of Introduction and Preface
Chapter One of Wilderness: A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One: Discovery. We must have been rowing for an hour across that seeming mile-wide stretch of water. The air is so clear in the north that one new to it is lost in the crowding of great heights and spaces distant peaks had risen over the lower mountains of the shore astern steep spruce-clad slopes confronted us all around was the wilderness a no-man's land of mountains or of cragged islands and southward the wide the limitless pacific ocean a calm blue summer's day and on we rode upon our search somewhere there must stand awaiting us as we had pictured it a little forgotten cabin one that some prospector or fisherman had built the cabin the grove the sheltered beach the spring or stream of fresh cold water we could have drawn it even to the view that it must overlook the sea and mountains and the glorious west we came to this new land a boy and a man entirely on a dreamer's search having had vision of a northern paradise we came to find it with less faith it might have seemed to us a hopeless thing exploring the unknown for what you've only dreamed was there doubt never crossed our minds to sail uncharted waters and follow virgin shores what a life for men as the new coast unfolds itself the imagination leaps into full vision of the human drama that there is imminent the grandeur of the ocean cliff is terrible with threat of shipwreck to that high ledge the wave may lift you there where that storm-dwarfed spruce has found a hold for half a century you perhaps could cling a hundred times a day you think of death or of escaping it by might and courage then at the first softening of the coast toward a cove or inlet you imagine all the mild beauties of a safe harbor the quiet water and the beach to land upon the house site a homestead of your own cleared land and pastures that look seaward now having crossed the bay thick wooded coast confronted us and we worked eastward toward a wide-mouthed inlet of that shore but all at once there appeared as if from nowhere a little motor-driven dory coming toward us we hailed and drew together to converse it was an old man alone we told him frankly what we were and what we sought oh come with me he cried heartily come and i show you the place to live and he pointed oceanward where straight in the path of the sun stood the huge dark mountain mass of an island then seizing upon our line he towed us with him to the south the gentle breeze came up with prow high in the air we spanked the wavelets and the glistening spray flew over us on we went straight at the dazzling sun and we laughed to think that we were being carried we knew not where and all the while the strange old man spoke never a word nor turned his head driving us on as if he feared we might demand to be unloosed at last his island towered above us it was truly sheer-sided and immense and for all we could discover harbourless till in a moment rounding the great headland of its northern end the crescent arms of the harbor were about us and we were there what a scene twin lofty mountain masses flanked the entrance and from the back of these the land dipped downwards like a hammock swung between them its lowest point behind the centre of the crescent a clean and smooth dark pebbled beach went all around the bay the tide line marked with driftwood gleaming bleached bones of trees fantastic roots and worn and shredded trunks 
above the beach a band of brilliant green and then the deep black spaces of the forest so huge was the scale of all of this that for some time we looked in vain for any habitation at last incredulously seeing what we had taken to be boulders assume the form of cabins the dories grounded and we leapt ashore and followed up the beach on to the level ground seeing and wondering with beating hearts and crying all the time to ourselves it isn't possible it isn't real there was a green grass lawn beneath our feet extending on one side under an orchard of neatly pruned alders to the mountain's base and on the other into the forest or along the shore in the midst of the clearing stood the old man's cabin he led us into it one little room neat and comfortable two windows south and west with a warm sun streaming through them a stove a table by the window with dishes piled neatly on it some shelves of food and one of books and papers a bunk with gaily striped blankets boots guns tools tobacco boxes a ladder to the storeroom in the loft and the old man himself a swede short round and sturdy head bald as though with a priestly tonsure high cheekbones and broad face full lips a sensitive small chin and his little eyes sparkled with good humor look this is all mine he was saying you can live here with me with me and nanny for by this time not only had the milk goat nanny entered but a whole family of foolish-faced angoras father mother and child nosed among us or overturning what they could in search of food he took us to the fox corral a few yards from the house there were the blues in its far corner eyeing us askance we saw the old goat cabin built of logs and were told of a newer one an unused one down the shore and deeper in the woods but come he said with pride i show you my location notice i have done it all in the proper way and i will get my title from washington soon i have staked fifty acres it is all described in the notice i have posted and i would like to see anybody get that away from me by now we had reached the great spruce tree to whose trunk he had affixed a sort of roofed tablet or shrine to house the precious document but ah look the tablet was bare only that from a small nail in it hung a torn shred of paper billy nanny roared the old man in irritation and mock rage and he shook his fist at the foolish-looking culprits who regarded us this time wisely from a distance and now come to the lake we went down an avenue through the tall spruce trees the sun flecked our path and fired here and there a flame-colored mushroom that blazed in the forest gloom right and left we saw deep vistas and straight ahead a broad and sunlit space a valley between hills there lay the lake it was a real lake broad and clean of many acres in extent and the whole mountainside lay mirrored in it with the purple zenith sky at our feet not a breath disturbed the surface not a ripple broke along the pebbly beach it was dead silent here but for maybe the far-off sound of surf and without motion but that high aloft two eagles soared with steady wings searching the mountain tops ah supreme moment these are the times in life when nothing happens but in quietness the soul expands time pressed and we turned back show us that other cabin we must go the old man took us by a short cut to the cabin he had spoken of it stood in a darkly shadowed clearing a log cabin of ample size with a small doorway that you stooped to enter inside was dark but for a little opening to the west there were the stalls for goats coops for some belgian hares he had once kept 
a tin whirligig for squirrels hanging in the gable peak, and underfoot a shaky floor covered with filth. But I knew what the cabin might become. I saw it once and said, This is the place we'll live. And then, returning to our boat, we shook hands on this great, quick finding of the things we'd sought, and since we could not stay then, as he begged us to, promised a speedy return with all our household goods. Olson's my name, he said. I need you here. We'll make a go of it. The south wind had risen, and the white caps flew. We crossed the bay, pulling lustily for very joy. Reaching the other shore, we saw, too late, crossing the bay in search of us, the small white sail of the party that had brought us part way from the town. So we turned and followed them, until at last we met, to their relief and the great satisfaction of our tired arms. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of Wilderness: A Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: Arrival. Our journal of Fox Island begins properly with the day of our final coming there, Wednesday, September the twenty-eighth, nineteen eighteen. At nine o'clock in the morning of that day, we slid our dory into the water from the beach at Seward, clamped our little patched-up three-and-one-half horsepower Evinrude motor in the stern, and commenced our loading. Since the main part of such a story, as in all these following pages we shall have to tell, must consist in the detailing of the innumerable little commonplaces of our daily lives, we shall begin at once with a list, as far as we have record of it, of all we carried with us. It follows. One Yukon stove, four links stovepipe, one broom, one bread pan, one wash basin, ten gallons gasoline, ten pounds rice, five pounds barley, ten pounds cornmeal, ten pounds rolled oats, ten pounds hominy, ten pounds farina, ten pounds sugar, fifty pounds flour, two packages bran, six cans cocoa, one pound tea, one case milk, eight pounds chocolate, one gallon syrup, one gallon cooking oil, one piece bacon, two cans dried eggs, two cans baked beans, six lemons, two packages pancake flour, ten pounds whole wheat flour, six ivory soap, three laundry soap, six agate cups, four agate plates, four agate bowls, two agate dishes one bean-pot, one mixing-bowl, turpentine, linseed oil, nails, etc., four pots, two pillows, two comforters, one roll building paper, one frying-pan, three bread tins, ten pounds lima beans, ten pounds white beans, five pounds Mexican beans, ten pounds spaghetti, twelve cans tomatoes, ten pounds potatoes, ten pounds dried peas, five pounds salt, one gallon peanut butter, one gallon marmalade, pepper, yeast, five pounds prunes, five pounds apricots, five pounds carrots, ten pounds onions, four cans soup, twelve candles, two Dutch cleanser, matches, one tea kettle, pails, etc. Also there were a heavy trunk containing books, paints, and so on, one duffel bag, one suitcase, and a few other things and when these were stowed away in the dory there was little room for ourselves however at ten o'clock we cast off and started for fox island with the little motor running beautifully it lasted for three miles when at once with a bang and a whirr the motor raced and the boat stood motionless on the calm gray water through the fog we could just discern the cabin of a fisherman on the nearest point of shore perhaps a mile distant we rowed there as best we could seated somehow atop our household goods we unloaded our useless motor our gasoline and our batteries cleared a little space in the boat for ourselves to man the oars and in a miserable drizzling rain pushed off for a long long pull to the island 
by too literal a following of directions i lengthened the remainder of the course to twelve miles and that we rode i don't know how in four hours and a half fortunately the water was as calm as could be rockwell was a revelation to me with scarcely a rest he pulled at the heavy oars that at first he had hardly understood to manage and when we reached the island he was hilarious with good spirits we unloaded with the help of olson whom by the way we must introduce at some length and stowed our goods in his house and shed we cooked our supper on his stove and slept that night and the next on his floor and then having our own quarters by that time in passable shape quit his friendly roof for the most hospitable kindly and altogether comfortable roof in the world our own olson is about sixty-five years of age he's a pioneer of alaska and knows the country from one end to the other he has prospected for gold in the yukon he was at nome with the first rush there he has trapped along a thousand miles of coast and now ever unsuccessful and still enterprising he is the proprietor of two pairs of blue foxes in corrals and four goats he's a kind-hearted genial old man with a vast store of knowledge and true wisdom the map shows our fox island estate our cabin was built as a shelter for angora goats somewhat over a year ago it is a roughly built log structure of about fourteen by seventeen feet inside dimensions and was quite dark but for the small door and a two by two feet opening on the western side we went to work upon it the morning following our arrival and in two days as has been told made it a fit place to live in but by no means the luxurious home that it was in our mind to make our cabin to-day is the product of weeks more labor to describe it is to account for our time almost to the beginning of the detailed days of this diary tread first upon a broad plank doorstep the hatch of some ill-fated vessel the sea's gift to us of a front veranda stoop your head to four feet six inches and drawing the latch-string enter before you at the south end of the sombre log interior is a mullioned window willing to admit more light than can penetrate the forest beyond before it is a fixed work-table littered with papers pencils paints and brushes on each long side of the cabin is a shelf of the eave height five feet from the floor the right-hand one is packed with foods in sacks and tins and boxes the left-hand shelf holds clothes and toys paints and a flute and at the far corner built to the floor in orthodox bookcase fashion a library we may glance at the books there are indian essays by kumaraswamy Griechische vasen the water babies robinson crusoe the prose edda anson's voyages a literary history of ireland douglas hyde the iliad the crock of gold the odyssey anderson's fairy tales the oxford book of english verse the home medical library blake's poems gilchrist's life of blake the tree dwellers the cave dwellers the sea people etc pacific coast tide table thus spake zarathustra the book of the ocean albrecht durer a short biography Willem meister nansen's in northern mists in the centre of the right-hand wall is a small low window and beneath it the dining-table right at the door where we stand to our left is the sheet-iron yukon stove and behind it another food-laden shelf a new floor of broad unplaned boards is under our feet a wooden platform it is a bed stands in the left-hand corner by the stove clothes hang under the shelves pots and pans upon the wall snowshoes and saws a rack for plates in one place a cupboard for potatoes and turnips behind the door the cellar it may be called the trunk for a seat boxes for chairs 
one stool for style, axes here and boots innumerable there, and we have, I think, all that the eye can take in of this adventurer's home. Trees stood thick about our cabin when we first came there, and between it and the shore a dense and continuous thicket of large alders and sapling spruces. Day by day we cleared the ground, cutting avenues and vistas, then, though contented at first with these, enlarging them until they merged and the sun began to shine about the cabin. It grew brighter then and drier. Nonsense! Am I mistaking the daylight for the sun? I can remember but one or two fair days in all the three weeks of our first stay on the island. For a true record of this matter, Olson's diary shall be copied into these pages. It follows in full with his own phonetic spelling as leaven. Sunday, August 25th, very fine day. Over to Hump Bay got two salmon on artist came are to-day, and going to seaward after his outfit, and are going to stay here this winter in the new cabin. Wednesday, 28th drizzly rain and cold mr kent and his son arrived from seward this afternoon goats out all night thursday twenty ninth goats came home twelve thirty p m mr kent working on the cabin fixing it up drizzly rain all night and all day friday thirtieth wary fine day and the goats vant for the mountain again help putting windows in to the cabin saturday thirty first foggy day big steamer coming to seward september sunday first made a trip around the island cloudy day monday two big rainstorm from the southeast goats all in the stable tuesday three drizzly rain all day wednesday four going to seward thursday five came home one p m Friday 6, drizzly rain and calm weather. Saturday 7, southeast rainstorm. Sunday 8, big southeast rainstorm. Monday 9, big southeast rainstorm. Tuesday 10, big southeast rainstorm. Wednesday 11, first cold night this fall, clear calm day. Thursday 12, cloudy and calm, tug and barge going west. Friday 13, steamer from the south, 5.30 p.m., drizzly rain and calm. Saturday 14, raining wary hard, the lightly Angora Queen are in hit this morning, freight steamer from west going to Seward. Sunday 15, raining wary hard all day, the goats are in the cabin all day, sought east storm. Monday 16, southeast storm. Tuesday, 17, raining all day. Northeast storm with caps and woolies all over. Wednesday, 18, wary fair day. Mr. Kent and the boy vant to Seward this morning. Thursday, 19, raining hard all day. Steamer from west going to Seward, 4 p.m. Friday, 20, raining hard all day. Wary rough rainstorm from southeast, woolies all over. Sunday, 22, Steamer from west going to Seward, 2 p.m. The tide very high, comes clear up in the grass, and the surf are stirring up all the driftwood along the shore, raining like hell. Monday, 23, raining all day. Tuesday, 24, snow on top of the mountains on the mainland, a three-masted schooner from west going to Seward, towed by some gas-boat raining to-day again. Mr. Kent and son got home to the island this evening. September 14th. I stopped writing, for the fire had almost gone out, and the cold wind blew in from two dozen great crevasses in the walls. The best of log cabins need recalking, I am told, once a year, and mine, roughly built as it is, needs it now in the worst way some openings are four or five inches wide by two feet long we've gathered a great quantity of moss for caulking but it has rained so persistently that it cannot dry out to be fit for use 
well it rains and rains and rains since beginning this journal we've had not one fair day and since we've been here on the island seventeen days there has been only one rainless day there has been but one cloudless sunrise i awoke that day just at dawn and looking across out of the tiny square window that faces the water could see the blue the deep blue mountains and the rosy western sky behind them at last the sun rose somewhere and tipped the peaks and the hanging glaciers growing and growing till the shadows of other peaks were driven down into the sea and the many ranges stood full in the morning light the twilight hours are so wonderfully long here as the sun creeps down the horizon just think there'll be months this winter when we'll not see the sun from our cove only see it touching the peaks above us or the distant mountains it will be a strange life without the dear warm sun i wonder if you can imagine what fun pioneering is to be in a country where the fairest spot is yours for the wanting it to cut and build your own home out of the land you stand upon to plan and create clearings parks vistas and make out of a wilderness an ordered place of course so much was done nearly all when i came but in clearing up the woods and in improving my own stead i have had a taste of the great experience ah it's a fine and wholesome life another day the storm rages out of doors Today I stuffed the largest of the cracks in our wall with woolen socks, sweaters, and all manner of clothes. It's so warm and cozy here now. Olson has been in to see me for a long chat. I believe he can give one the material for a thrilling book of adventure. Take his story, or enough of the thousand wild incidents of it, give it its true setting, publishing a map of that part of the coast where his travels mostly lay let it be frankly his story retold above all true and savoring of this land and i believe no record of pioneering or adventure could surpass it he's a keen philosopher and by his critical observations gives his discourse a fine dignity on olson's return to idaho in the eighties after his first trip to alaska a friend of his a saloon keeper came out into the street seized him and drew him into his place sit down olson he said and tell us about alaska from beginning to end and the traveller told his long wonder story to the crowd at last he finished olson said his friend that would make the greatest book in the world if it was only lies gee how the storm rages i'm relieved to-night rockwell who seems to have a felon on his finger is improving under the heroic treatment he submits to i've had visions of operating on it myself a deep incision to the bone being the method it is no fun having such ailments to handle unless you're of the type olson seems to be who if his eye troubled him seriously would stick in his finger and pull the eye out and then doubtless fill the socket with tobacco juice we have reached wednesday september the eighteenth that day the sun did shine we rode to seward rockwell and i stopped for the motor that on our last trip we had left by the way but found the surf too high at seward the beach was strewn with damaged and demolished boats from a recent storm moreover in the town the glacial stream was swollen to a torrent the barriers had some of them been swept away a bridge was gone the railroad tracks were flooded the hospital was surrounded and almost floated from its foundations and we saw the next day when it again poured rain the black-robed sisters of charity booted to the thighs fleeing through the water to a safer place it stormed incessantly for four days more although i had taken what seemed ample precaution for the safety of my dory she was caught at the height of the storm by the exceptional tide of that season and carried against a stranded boat high up on the shore 
and pinioned there by a heavy pile torn from the wharf but our boat escaped undamaged seward was dull for rockwell and me we've not come this long way from our home for the life of a small town america offers nothing to the tourist but the wonders of its natural scenery all towns are of one mould or inspired as it were with one ideal and i cannot see in considering the buildings of a single period in the east and in the west any indication of diversity of character of ideals of special tradition any susceptibility to the influence of local conditions nothing in any typical american house or town where i have been that does not say made in one mill there's a god-forsaken hideousness and commonplaceness about alaskan architecture that almost amounts to character but it is not quite bad enough to redeem itself somewhere in the wilderness of the canadian rockies there's a little town of one street backed up against the towering mountains dominating the town is the two or three-story queen hotel the last word in flamboyant gimcrack hideousness hotel and mountain it is sublime that bald and crashing contrast on september third i wrote to a friend they strike me as needlessly timid about the sea here continually talking of frightful currents and winds in a way that seems incredible to me and would i think to a new england fisherman however i must be cautious olson says that in the winter for weeks at a time it has been impossible to make the trip to seward well i'll believe it when i try it and get stuck three weeks later tuesday september twenty fourth we were in seward the morning was calm varying between sun and rain but it seemed a good day to return to fox island rockwell and i had some difficulty launching our boat down the long beach at low water but at last we managed it loaded our goods aboard viz two large boxes of groceries fifty-nine pounds turnips a stove five links of stovepipe a box of wood panels two hundred feet one inch by two inch strips suitcase snowshoes and a few odd parcels at ten forty five we pushed off at just about that moment the sun retired for the day and a fine and persistent rain began to fall after about three miles we were overtaken by a fisherman in a motor sloop bound to his camp three miles further down the shore he took us in tow and finally arriving at his camp begged us to stay for a cup of tea he was an englishman i yielded to the delay there against my own better judgment after a hearty meal we left his cove at two fifteen still it drizzled rain and the breeze blew faintly from the northeast we had a seven-mile row before us near cane's head we encountered squalls from the south and were for some time in doubt as to the wind's true direction we headed straight for fox island only to find the wind easterly compelling us to head up into it i fortunately anticipated a heavier blow and determined to get as far to windward and as near the shelter of the lee shore as possible and without any loss of time our propulsion toward the island i left to the tide which was about due to ebb we made good headway for a little time until the wind bore upon us in heavy squalls the aspect of the day had become ominous heavy clouds raced through the sky precipitating rain the mountainous land appeared blue-black the sea a light but brilliant yellow-green over the water the wind blew in furious squalls raising a surge of white caps and a dangerous chop i was now rowing with all my strength foreseeing clearly the possibility of disaster for us scanning with concern the terrible leeward shore with its line of breakers and steep cliffs rockwell rowing always manfully had great difficulty in the rising sea and wind fortunately he realized only at rare moments the dangers of our situation we were now rowing continually at right angles to our true course i had but one hope 
to get to windward before the rising sea and gale overpowered us and carried us on to the dreaded coast that offered absolutely no hope once to windward i had the choice of making a landing in some cove or continuing for fox island by running with the wind astern at last the surface of the water was fairly seething under the advancing squalls the spray was whipped into vapour and the cauldron boiled i bent my back to the oars and put every ounce of strength into holding my own with the gale it was a terrible moment for i saw clearly the alternative of continuing and winning our fight father pipes up rockwell from behind me at this tragic instant when i wake up in the morning sometimes i pretend my toes are asleep and i make my big toe sit up first because he's the father toe at another time rockwell who had shown a little panic a very little said you know i want to be a sailor so i'll learn not to be afraid at last we turned and made for the island we had reached the point where with good chances of success we could turn and where we had to we reached the shelter of the island incredibly fast it seemed with the sea boiling in our wake racing furiously as if to engulf us and then bearing us so smoothly and swiftly upon its crest that if it had not been so terrible it would have been the most soothing and delightful motion in the world in rounding the headland of our cove a last furious effort of the eluded storm careened us sailless as we were far on one side and carried us broadside toward the rocks it was a minute before we could straighten our boat into the wind and pull away from the shore then twenty feet away olson awaited us on the beach with tackle in readiness to haul our boat out of the surf we landed in safety looking at my watch i found it to be a quarter to six the last four miles had taken us three hours olson's dory had been hauled up onto the grass and tied down securely mine was soon beside it the tides and heavy seas of this time of year make every precaution necessary the wind that night continued rising till it blew a gale and that night in their bed rockwell and his father put their arms tight about each other without telling why they did it wednesday september twenty fifth it stormed from the northeast throughout the day after putting the cabin in order and hanging out our bedding to dry by the stove for we had found it very damp i set about cutting a large spruce tree whose high top shut out the light from our main windows a few more still stand in the way the removal of all of them should give us a fair amount of light even in the winter when the sun is hid it occurs to me that it may be rather fortunate that my studio window looks to the south i'll certainly not be troubled with sunlight while i may yet borrow some of the near sun brilliancy from above our mountain's top rockwell and i worked some time with a cross-cut saw i'm constantly surprised by his strength and stamina rockwell read nine pages in his book of the cave dwellers so nine of robinson crusoe were due him after supper he undresses and jumps into bed and cuddles close to me as i sit there beside him reading and robinson crusoe is a story to grip his young fancy and make this very island a place for adventure thursday september twenty sixth these are typical days i begin to feel sure of prevailing alaska weather it rains not hard but almost constantly nothing is dry but the stove and the wall behind it the vegetation is saturated the deep moss floor of the woods is full as a sponge can be we took the moss that weeks ago we'd gathered and spread along the shore to dry and commenced with this sopping stuff the caulking of our cabin it went rapidly and the two gable ends are nearly done what a difference it makes to-night when my fire roared for the biscuit baking the heat was almost unbearable the usual chores of wood and water 
a little work at manufacturing stationery, supper of farina, cornbread, peanut butter, and tea, six pages for Rockwell, and the day, but for this diary, is done. Friday, September 27th. At last it's fair after a clear moonlit night. I worked all day about the cabin, caulking it and almost finishing that job, splitting wood and working with the cross-cut saw. Added stops to the frame of our door, made a mitre box, and cut my long strips brought from Seward last trip into pieces for my stretcher frames. And Rockwell, all this time, helped cheerfully when he was called upon, played boat on the beach, hunted imaginary wild animals with his bow and arrow of Stone Age design, and was, as always, so contented, so happy, that the day was not half long enough. Ah, the evenings are beautiful here, and the early mornings, when the days are fair. No sudden springing of the sun into the sky and out again at night, but so gradual, so circuitous a coming and a going, that nearly the whole day is twilight, and the quiet rose color of morning and evening seems almost to meet at noon. We glance through our tiny western window at sunrise and see beyond the bay the many ranges of mountains, from the somber ones at the water's edge to the distant glacier and snow-capped peaks, lit by the far-off sun with the loveliest light imaginable. Tonight for supper a dish of Olson's goat's milk clabber, phonetic spelling, simply sour milk with all its cream upon it, thick to a jelly. It was, in the favorite expression of Rockwell, delicious. Saturday, September 28th. Beginning fresh, but overcast, the day soon brought us rain, and it is now raining gently as I write. And yet we accomplished a great deal, clearing of undergrowth a part of the woods between us and the shore, felling three more trees, and cutting up a monster tree with the cross-cut saw. At dinner-time Olson ran in with the greatest excitement. On the path in the woods near the outlet of the lake he had seen at one time five otters. They came from the water and advanced to within twenty feet of where he and Nanny, the milk-goat, stood. And there they played long enough for him to have taken a dozen pictures. In the afternoon we saw a number of otters at another place, on the rocks at one end of the beach. They were in and out of the water, going at times for little excursion swims far out into the harbor, then chasing each other back, and playing hide-and-go-seek among the rocks. This afternoon I prepared all my wood panels to begin my work, painting them on both sides. Sunday, September twenty-ninth. The Lord must have been pleased with us to-day, for the grand clearing up we gave this place of His. Olson has begun to work toward me in clearing the still wild part of the intervening space between our cabins. It begins to look park-like, with trees stripped of limbs ten or twelve feet from the ground, and the mossy floor beneath swept clean. With the cross-cut saw I finished up the giant tree we felled a few days ago, and then, the ground being clear, I cut the large tree that kept so much light from our windows. The difference it has made is wonderful. Our room is flooded with light. There is a fascination in cutting trees. Once I have gripped my axe, or even the tedious saw, I find it hard to relinquish it, returning to it again and again for one more cut. I believe that the clearing of homesteads gave the pioneer a compelling interest in life that was in wonderful contrast to the ordinary humdrum labor to which at first he must have been bred. It is easy to understand the rapid conquest of the wilderness. Begin it, and you cannot stop. Rockwell has set his heart upon trapping, in the kindest and most considerate way known, some wild thing, and having it for a pet. I rather discouraged his taming the sea-urchin, and persuaded him, out of consideration for the intelligent creature's feelings, to restore him to the salt-water, and let me have back the bread-pan. But now one of Olson's box-traps is set for a magpie. 
They're plentiful here. I built myself a fine easel to-day, the best one I've ever had, and put a shelf under my drawing-table. The room is clean and neat to-night. It is in every way a congenial place. I don't see why people need better homes than this. It was cloudy most of to-day, and rained a very little from time to time. Soon I can no longer keep from painting. Monday, September 30th. The morning, brilliant, clear, and cold, with the wind in the north. I promised Rockwell an excursion when we had cut six sections from a tree with the cross-cut saw. It went like the wind. Then, with cheese, chocolate, and Swedish hardbread in my pocket for a lunch, we started for the lowest ridge of the island that overlooks the east. We had always believed this to be a short and easy ascent, until one day, just before supper, we tried it in a forced march and found, after the greatest exertions in climbing, that the ridge lay still the good part of an hour's climb above us. So to-day, though we chose our path more wisely, it proved hard climbing along rough stream-beds, across innumerable fallen trees, through alder, bramble, and blueberry thickets, and always with the soft, oozy moss underfoot. But we reached the top steep to the very edge. Suddenly the trees ended, the land ended, falling sheer away four hundred feet below us, and we stood in wonder, looking down and out, over a smooth green floor of sea and a fairyland of mountains, peaks, and gorges, and headlands that cast long purple shadows on the green water. Clouds wreathed the mountains, snow was on their tops, and in the clear atmosphere both the land and the sea were marvellous for the beauty of their infinite detail. Tiny white-crested wavelets patterned the water's surface with the utmost precision and regularity, and the land invited one to its smooth and mossy slopes, its dark enchanted forests, its still coves and sheltered valleys, its nobly proportioned peaks. It was a rare hour for us, too. We then followed the ridge toward the south, walking in the smoothly trodden paths of the porcupines. It led us up the lofty hill on the east side of the island between its two coves. But the steepness of the ascent, and the matted thickets of storm-dwarfed alders that were in our way, were too much, I thought, for Rockwell, and after going some distance farther alone, I returned to him, and we started homewards. Once on the mountain side we sat in the moss and mountain cranberry to rest, and all at once we saw a great old porcupine come clambering up the hill a short way from us. I spoke to him in his own whiny moany language, and he was much pleased. He sat up, listened, and then came almost straight towards us. I continued talking to him until after several corrections of his course, determined upon by sitting up and listening, he arrived within four or five feet of Rockwell, and sat up again. We could hardly keep from laughing, he looked so foolish, but he sensed things to be wrong, dropped down, elevated his quills, then turned and started off. Somehow I couldn't let him go without annoying him, so grabbing a stick I pursued him, poking at him, to collect a few quills but at this Rockwell set up such a shrieking and wailing that I had to stop, and finally apologized profusely and explained that I meant no harm to the sweet creature. Rockwell madly loves wild animals, has not the slightest fear of them, and would really, I believe, try out his theory of calming the anger of a bear by kissing him. Then we came home and had a good dinner. I cut more wood, and at last, after one month here on the island, I painted. It was a stupid sketch, but no matter, I've begun. A weasel came out and looked at me as I worked, then whisked off. The magpies look into our trap, squint at the food, and then at once leave that neighborhood. It is cloudy and rain-like to-night. 
Is it too much to hope for more than one fair day? End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Wilderness, a Journal of Quiet Adventure in Alaska by Rockwell Kent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Chores. Tuesday, October first. Today it rained. We attended first to our fascinating chores, plying the crosscut saw as the drizzle fell. Then we went to work as artists, Rockwell with his watercolors, and I with my oils. Rockwell has a number of good drawings of the country here, and of the things that have thrilled him. Pop! The cork of my jug of new-made yeast has just struck the ceiling. That brew has been a part of this day's work. Hops, potatoes, flour, sugar, raisins, and yeast, stewed and strained and bottled, Today also was completed and served the first Fox Island Corn Souffle. Take two cups of samp, whole hominy, and stew for an indefinite time in salted water. It should cook at least three or four hours. It should boil almost dry. Make of the remainder of the water and some milk two cups of cream sauce, dissolving in it some cheese. Mix with the corn and pour into a baking dish. Spread cheese over the top and put into oven to brown. We offer this delicious discovery to the world on the condition only that Fox Island corn souffle shall be printed on the menu wherever it is used. I made today a grandfather's chair for myself. It is as comfortable as it is beautiful. Every day I read in the history of Irish literature. The Deidre saga I read today. It must be one of the most beautiful and the most perfect stories in all the world. So little do we feel ourselves related, here in this place, to any one time or to any civilization, that at a thought we and our world become whom and what we please. Rockwell has been a cave-dweller hunting the primeval forest with a stone hatchet and a bow of alder strung with a root. To me it is the heroic age in Ireland. Wednesday, October 2nd. Incessant hard rain. The two artists at their work a good part of the day, Rockwell making several new drawings in his book of wonderful animals. We bathed and I washed the accumulated clothes of several weeks. And tonight Olson came for a long call. He's a good storyteller and his experiences are without end and so closes this day, with the rain still pouring monotonously on the roof. Thursday, October 3rd. Today was fair at sunrise, cloudy at nine o'clock, and showery all the rest. We worked again with the beloved crosscut saw, setting ourselves an almost unattainable task, and then surpassing it. And I cleared the thicket for a better view of the mountain to the south, and in the afternoon felled another large tree, stretched canvas for a while, and painted and drew, and felt the goddess inspiration returning to me. Olson, Rockwell, and I, with levers and blocks, turned and emptied the three boats that the recent rain had almost filled. Already we fear the frost. The mountains have been capped with snow, all green has gone from their sides, the dark season is near at hand. Rockwell is ever sweet, industrious, and happy. He is beautiful after his bath. Friday, October 4th. A gloriously lovely day. A cloudless sky and the wind in the north. That puts life into men. Up at sunrise, we two. Before breakfast, the axe was going, and afterwards we brought down two mighty trees. The trees of this part of Alaska are not to be compared with the giants of the western states. Two feet is a large diameter. Then I painted for a while futilely the green and wind-blown sea, the pink mountains, snowy peaks, and golden morning sky. Rockwell and I couldn't restrain our spirits and had to clamber up the steep mountainside. Up, 
Up we went straight above our clearings, and soon in looking back the bay, the lake, and our neck of land lay like a map below us. Cliffs and the steep slopes baffled us at times, but we found a way at last to reach the peak of the spur above us there it was like a pavilion a rounded knoll carpeted with moss a ring of slender clean-trunked trees and beyond that nothing nearer than the sea nine hundred feet below coming down we ran across a porcupine toiling up the slope we played with him a bit and finally let him climb a tree olson would have had us bring him home for dinner they're said to taste good we cut with the saw a while in the afternoon. Rockwell drew, and I made two more sketches, one a good one. The evening at sundown was more brilliant even than the day. For such days as this we have come to Alaska. Saturday, October 5th. A hard day full of little bits of work. Sawed up a tree alone to punish Rockwell for not studying. Caulking the east side of the cabin the last side, painted, baked, and built myself an arrangement out of doors to sketch in comfort. I sit on the board with my palette, a box end, secured before me, and my picture above it. Rockwell took his punishment so to heart that in the afternoon he read ten pages in his book. All of today has been overcast, but with a clean, refreshing atmosphere in the account of anson's voyage around the horn it is remarked that fair weather in those latitudes rarely lasts it may be true of the same latitudes north monday october seventh yesterday i wrote nothing in the diary there was nothing to write but that it rained rain like hell olson's journal doubtless reads and ditto for today. the storm is even harder now the wind strikes our cabin first from the west then north east and south the surface of the cove is seething under the cross squalls that is called the woolies a boat not strongly managed would be whipped round and round olson has been much in to see us lonely old man i drop my drawing while he is here and take to stretching canvas all the while yarning with him Rockwell likes the calls as a diversion. Rockwell's good humor and contentment is without limit. He draws with the deepest interest hours a day, reads for a time, and plays, talking to himself. We have good hearty fights together, in which Rockwell attacks me with all his strength, and I hit back with force in self-defense. We have a good time washing dishes, racing, the washer myself, to beat the dryer. Rockwell falls down onto the floor in the midst of the race in a fit of laughter. Rockwell's happiness is not complete until I spank him. I grab the struggling creature and throw him down, trying to hold both his hands and feet to have free play in beating him. This I do with some strength, sometimes using a stick of kindling wood. The more it hurts, the better Rockwell likes it, up to a limit that we never reach. So much for the day's play of our work mine is mostly over the drawing-table both yesterday and today i made good drawings and my ideas come crowding along fast cooking somehow is the least troublesome of all the daily chores we live as may be imagined with a simplicity that would send a hoover delegate flying from the door in dismay this is our daily fare breakfast invariably the same oatmeal cocoa bread and peanut butter dinner beans one of several kinds and several ways or fox island corn souffle or spaghetti or peas or vegetable stew barley carrots onions potatoes and potatoes or rice and often prunes or apricots or apples dried supper invariably the same farina cornbread with peanut butter or marmalade tea for father milk for son and sometimes dessert stewed fruit chocolate or when olson gives it goat milk junket let us here record that to this date we have had not the least little sickness only glowing health and good spirits 
Tuesday, October 8th. Rain! But what difference does it make to us? Every one is in a good humour. The house is warm and dry. We've lots to eat and lots to do. Olson's dory was again half full of water, so we turned her and the skiff over. I stretched canvas and primed it and finished Anson's Voyage Around the World, a thrilling book. Late this afternoon it began to clear. The sun shone, and we were presently at work with the saw, only to be driven in again by the shower. I expect fair weather to-morrow, but— Wednesday, October ninth. Fair weather is still as far away as ever, unless a sharp but cloudy afternoon and sundown with brilliant light in the western sky spell change. Olson says the foxes will not eat to-night, and that this is invariably a sign of change to good days, that in bad weather they eat, and in fair they abstain. It poured in the morning, and we worked indoors. After dinner we all moved a lumber-pile that stood on the shore abreast of our cabin to a place nearer Olson's, this only to better our view of the water. We sawed wood for a while, and piled all that we have so far cut ready for winter use. There are in all fifty sections of short stove-wood. That is a month and a half supply. I painted towards evening, and made two good sketches. The nights have grown colder. For the past two days the mountains across from us, the nearest ones, have been covered with snow downwards to half their height. The farther ranges have for weeks been white. They're beautiful, and invite one to go climbing and sliding over their smooth white snowfields. Close to, one would find impassable crags and crevasses, a howling wind and bitter cold. Rockwell today finished his second book, The Cave Dwellers. Midnight Bulletin. The stars are out, brilliant in a cloudless sky. Thursday, October 10th. It's raining! All day has been overcast, but sharp and clear. It was for us all a day of hard work. We cleared up the woods between Olson's cabin and ours, carrying one large pile of brush from our dooryard to the beach, and burning another huge one. That was a wild sight as night came. It had become a great fire of logs burning steadily and lighting up all the woods around. It is still burning in the pouring rain. We saw it a little, always more than keeping pace with our consumption of wood. Rockwell worked almost the whole day and went to bed tired. I read to him an hour. He loves to hear poetry. We set an elaborate contrivance to catch a magpie, and were humiliated by the bird who walked round and round the snare, eyeing it wisely then suddenly rushed in only far enough to secure a piece of decoy bait, and fled. Painted today, making a good little sketch, but on my first trial of the homemade canvas, finding it to need more priming. Work! Work! Friday, October 11th. This day we should have been in Seward. It was calm, although it rained from time to time. Olson offered to tow us across to Kane's head, but the rain coming up as we were about to start in the morning, we waited till afternoon, started, proceeded half a mile, encountered engine trouble, and finally, ignominiously, rode home, I pulling Olson and his motor, and Rockwell bringing in our own dory. If it had not been so late, we would have kept on. We have a magpie. I saw one hop into Olson's shed, quickly ran and closed the door and there he was. Now he's in a box-trap cage set on a specially constructed shelf on our front gable. He's a garrulous creature and bites angrily, but he's a youngster and we hope to teach him to say all sorts of pretty things. Olson says they take naturally to swearing. So Rockwell has at last a pet. If only it will hold calm. Tonight it is fair and starlight, but we can never be sure of the weather's constancy. We hold everything in readiness to start in the morning. Saturday, October 12th. A mild and lovely day on our island, but in the bay a breeze from the north that would have made our rowing to Seward difficult. 
still we wait with our things assembled for the trip we shall go at the very first good chance this morning olson cleared the limbs from the trees about us to ten or twelve feet from the ground only the tall clean trunks are now between us and our mountains across the bay i painted most of the afternoon my canvas is still quite impossible rough and absorbent we built a large cage for the magpie he was so restless in his small one and now he's quite contented rockwell said today that he would like to live here always that when he was grown he'd come here with his many children and me if i was not dead and stay it is hard to write it is hard to work with the trip to seward at hand olson says it is sunday i think he's right somehow i've missed a day sunday october thirteenth i still keep to my chronology until we find out from seward where we stand a wonderfully beautiful day with a raging northwest wind i must sometime honor the northwest wind in a great picture as the embodiment of clean strong exuberant life the joy of every young thing bearing energy on its wings and the will to triumph how i remember at monaghan on such a day when it seemed that every living thing must emerge from its house or its hole or its nest to breathe the clean air and exult in it when men could stand on the hilltops and look far over the green sea and the distant land and delight in the infinite detail of the view discerning distant ships at sea and remote blue islands and over the land sparkling cities and such enchanting forests and pastures that the spirit leaped the intervening miles and with a new delight claimed the whole earth to the farthest mountains and beyond on such a day there crept from his hole an artist and shading his squinting eyes with his hand saluted the day with a groan how can one paint he said such sharpness here is no mystery no beauty and he crept back this fog lover to await for earth's sick spell to return this morning the magpie sang or recited poetry he made strange glad noises in his throat and that in a cage we worked the rest of us like mad at five-thirty olson resting at last said well you've done a great day's work and after that i painted a sketch cut and trimmed three small spruce trees and then it being dark prepared supper but when do we go to seward my bag is packed olson begins each day by testing his motor the wind must moderate in time we see it pass our cove driving the water as in a mill race today it swept the cove itself rockwell went for a walk in the woods he has a delightful time on his rambles discovering goat's wool on the bushes following the paths of the porcupines to their holes and today finding the porcupine himself he always returns with some marvelous discovery or new enthusiasm over his explorations he has been practicing writing today. He says that if he could only write, he would put down the wonderful stories of his dreams. These stories would run into volumes. Tuesday, October 15th. Yesterday we left the island. The day was calm, though cloudy, and at times it rained. Olson towed us to Canehead. From there we made good time, Rockwell rowing like a seasoned oarsman, as indeed he has now a right to be called. We stopped at the camp where we had in August left our broken-down engine, and brought that away with us, as well as some turnips and half a dozen heads of beautiful lettuce grown on that spot. By night it was raining hard and blowing from the southeast. We spent the evening at the postmaster's house playing i on the flute to miss postmaster's accompaniment it went splendidly and until midnight we played beethoven bach haydn gluck tchaikovsky till it seemed like old times at home then rockwell with his eyes shut in sleep consumed a piece of apricot pie and a glass of milk and we came home bringing along two glasses of wild currant preserve 
I read my letters over and then went to bed. But the storm raged by that time, and I couldn't sleep for worry about my boat. At last I rose and dressed and went down to the shore. The dory was safely stranded, but too low down. So with great toil I worked her higher up the beach beyond high water. Today it has rained incessantly. I have bought a few odd supplies and registered for the draft. Above all, today, the engine has resumed its running and will return to Fox Island under power. I know nothing about an engine, but I have eight miles to learn in before the only hazardous part of the voyage begins. Tonight Rockwell and I spent the evening at the house of a young man whom we've found congenial, and who above all is a friend of a young German mechanic for whom I've a liking. So the four of us sang the evening through, seated before a great open fire. The house is of logs, and stands out of the town on the border of the wilderness. There are spots like this little house and its hospitable hearth that show even the commercial desert of Seward to have its oases. And now we're in our room. Rockwell is asleep in bed. It is past midnight. I am thinking of dear friends at home, and I bid them affectionately good night. Thursday, October 17th. Yesterday in Seward was about as every other day. We spent it between letter writings in our hotel room and visiting from store to store. It poured rain and blew from the southeast. We spent our evening with the German. We have planned with him to signal back and forth from Seward, particularly to send me the news of peace. If I can distinguish with glasses a high-powered electric light that he will show from a house on the highest point in the town, then, by means of the Morse code with which I am furnished and which he knows, I'll receive messages on appointed days. Tonight Rockwell and I went a quarter of a mile down our beach to a point that commands a view up the bay to Seward, and lighted a bonfire there. Böhm, the German, was regarding us, we presume, through a telescope. On Sunday night, if it is clear, we are to look for his light. The difficulty will be to distinguish it from others. We left Seward this morning at 9.45, our dory laden with about 1,000 pounds of freight, including ourselves. The little three-and-one-half horsepower motor worked splendidly and carried us to the island in a little over two and a quarter hours. The day was calm, to begin with, with a rising north wind as we crossed from Cain's Head. On the island we found a visitor. There had been two other men, but they were gone to Seward the night before. All had been on Monday forced by the rough sea to turn back from attempting to go around the western cape. The old fellow who is still here told me tonight that in the twenty years that he had been in Alaska he had never seen such weather. That's good news. At Seward the mountains are covered with snow to within a few hundred feet of the town's level. I'm tired. This ends today. Incidentally, my dates proved to be correct when I reached Seward. Oh, I've almost forgotten our loss. The poor magpie lay dead on the floor of his cage. So we found him, killed, I believe, by the storm, for Olson neglected to cover him. Rockwell, who straight on landing had run over there, wept bitterly, but finally found some consolation in giving him a very decent burial and marking the spot with a wooden cross. Friday, October 18th. The night is beautiful beyond thought. All the bay is flooded with moonlight, and in that pale glow the snowy mountains appear whiter than snow itself. The full moon is almost straight above us, and shining through the treetops into our clearing makes the old stumps quite lovely with its quiet light. And the forest around us is as black as the abyss. Although it is nearly ten o'clock, Rockwell is still awake. It is his birthday, by our choice. His one present, a cheap child's edition of Wood's Natural History, illustrated, has filled his head with dreams of his beloved wild animals. I began tonight to teach him to sing. We tried Brahms' Wiegenlied with little success, and then Schlafkindlein Schlaf, 
which went better. These songs and many other German songs, all with English words, are in the songbook I bought him. I hope I shall have the patience and the time to succeed with Rockwell in this. Three men are now with Olson in his cabin, for the two who were gone to Seward returned today. They are younger men, one of them Emsweiler, a well-known guide of this country. I spent an interesting hour with them this evening. Olson told me today that his age is seventy-one. The smell of fresh bread is in our cabin, for I baked today. Baking, wood-cutting, darning of socks, putting the cabin in order, and the building of a shelf. These, with the other usual chores, were the whole day's work. A profitless day lies on my conscience. I shall draw a little, and then go to bed. Saturday, October 19th. Today was raw and cloudy, mild and sunny. In the morning, windy, in the afternoon, dead calm, so that the hills were reflected in the bay. The men have left, I am glad to say, not that they were in themselves at all objectionable, but it somehow did violence to the quiet of this place to have others about. Emsweiler slaughtered one of the goats for Olson, so there's now one less of us here. I felled a large tree today, and later sharpened the cross-cut saw preparatory to cutting it up. Tonight the sun set in the utmost splendor, and left in its wake blazing fire-red clouds in a sky of luminous green. Not many more days shall we see the sun. It sets now close to the southern headland of our cove. Rockwell works every day on his wild animal book. To obtain absolutely new and original names for his strange creatures, he has devised an interesting method. With eyes closed, he prints a name, or rather a group of miscellaneous letters. Naturally, the result he perceives on opening his eyes is astonishing. Sunday, October 20th. It has been a beautiful, clear, cold, violent northwest day. I've painted on and off all day with woodcutting between. One can't stop going in such weather, and out of doors you can't stand still, for it is too icy cold and windy. Rockwell and I have just now, eight o'clock, returned from down the beach, where we went to look for lights from Seward, but we could distinguish nothing meant for us. The moon has risen and illuminates the mountain tops, but we and all our cove are still in the deep shadow of the night. It is most dramatic. The spruces about us deepen the shadow to black, while above them the stone faces of the mountain glisten, and the sky has the brightness of a kind of day. Olson brought us goat chops for dinner. We could not have told them from lamb. This afternoon a small power-boat appeared in the bay, attempting to make its way toward Seward. After some progress the wind forced her steadily and swiftly back. When we last saw her she seemed to be trying to make the shelter of our island or one of the outer islands, the while driving steadily seaward. It's a wild night to be out in the bay, though doubtless calm at sea. It is such an adventure that we must be on our guard against. As we look across the bay toward Bear Glacier, which is hidden by a point of land, we can see the effect of the north wind sweeping down the glacier a mist driving seaward. It is nothing less than the fine spray of that wind-swept water. Monday, October 21st. It is so late that I shall write only a little. Today was again wonderful, a true golden and blue northwest day. I have painted and sawed wood and built myself a splendid six-legged sawhorse. Olson thinks I have already cut my winter supply of wood but it seems to me far from it. Rockwell has been most of the day at his own animal book, making some strange and beautiful birds. This morning the ground was frozen with a hard crust. It did not thaw throughout the day, and again to-night it is very cold. Winter is at last upon us, the long, long winter. And the sun retreats day by day farther toward the mountain. I look to the sun's going with a kind of dread. 
we have seen nothing of the boat that last night was driven to shelter we believe the men to be in the other cove of our island End of chapter three chapter four of wilderness a journal of quiet adventure in alaska by rockwell kent this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four winter endlessly day after day the journal goes on recording a dreary monotony of rain and cloud who has ever dwelt so entirely alone that the most living things in all the universe about are wind and rain and snow where the elements dominate and control your life where at getting up and bedtime and many an hour of night and day between you question helplessly as a poor slave his master the will of the mighty forces of the sky dawn breaks you jump from bed stand barefoot on the threshold of the door look through the straight trunked spruces at the brightening world and read at sight god's will for one more whole long day of life ah god it rains again and sitting on the bed you wearily draw on your heavy boots and rainy spirited begin the special labors of a rainy day or maybe at the sight of clouds again you laugh at the dull-minded weatherman or curse at him good-naturedly still you must do those rainy weather chores and all the other daily chores in hot wet weather garments that is destiny most of the time to do ourselves real justice we met the worst of weather with a battle cry worked hard and then made up for outdoor dreariness and wet by heaping on the comforts of indoors dry cozy warmth good things to eat and lots to do we have reached late fall for northern latitudes the sky is brooding ominously heavy dull and raw winter seems to be closing in upon us we're driven to work as if in fear hurry hurry saw the great drums of spruce roll them over the ground stack them high caulk tight with hemp the cabin's windward eaves so that no breath of wind can enter there and freeze the food inside upon the shelf set up the far-famed air-tight stove where it will keep you warm warm feet in bed and a warm back while painting patch up the poor storm-battered paper roof two or three holes we find and we are sure it leaks from twenty about the cabin pile the hemlock boughs dense leafed and warm making a green slope almost to the eaves now it looks cozy outside and in the last is done to make us ready for the winter's worst and just in time it is the evening of october twenty second and the feathery snow has just begun to fall olson comes stamping in well well he cries how's this how does our winter suit you it suits us perfectly the house is warm rockwell's in bed and i am reading treasure island to him what are you going to make of him asked olson that night speaking of rockwell i was at that moment pouring beans into the pot for baking i slowed the stream and dropped them one by one rich man poor man beggar man thief doctor lawyer merchant chief how in the world can any one lay plans for a youngster's life rockwell lay in his bed dreaming maybe of an existence lovelier far than anything the poor discouraged imagination of a man could reach a child could make a paradise of earth life is so simple unerringly he follows his desires making the greatest choices first then onward into a narrowing pathway until the true goal is reached how can one preach of beauty or teach another wisdom these things are of an infinite nature and in every one of us in just proportion there is no priesthood of the truth we live in many worlds rockwell and i the world of the books we read an always changing one robinson crusoe treasure island the visionary world of william blake the saga age 
water babies, and the glorious Celtic past, Rockwell's own world of fancy, kingdom of beasts, the world he dreams about and draws, and my created land of striding heroes and poor fate-bound men, real as I have painted them, or to me nothing is and then all round about us our common daily island world itself more wonderful than we have half a notion of is it to be believed that we are here alone this boy and i far north out on an island wilderness sea-girt on a terrific coast it's as we pictured it and wanted it a year and more ago yes dreams come true and now the snow falls softly winter to meet our challenge has begun short notes in the journal mark treasure island's swift passage then enter water babies just after rockwell's heart and mine i have recorded it but kingsley must lose his friends a warning to the snob in literature how it did weary us and madden us his english gentry pride unless we outright laughed at last it's finished that's an event when kingsley isn't showing off he's moralizing and between his religious cant and his english snobbery he is in spite of his occasional sweet sentiment quite unendurable so to-night we read from anderson's fairy tales forever lovely and true children have their own fine literary taste that we know quite too little about they love all real authentic happenings and they love pure fairy tale but to them fiction in the guise of truth is wrong and fairy romance unconvincing in its details is ridiculous action they like the deed not thought about it doubtless the simple saga form is best of all life as it happens neither right nor wrong words that they can understand things they can comprehend interesting facts or thrilling fancy such simple things delight the child that half of robinson crusoe and three-quarters of the smug family from switzerland are forgiven for the sweet kernel of pure adventure that is there as for adventure that is relative where little happens and the gamut of expression is narrow life is still full of joy and sorrow you're stirred by simple happenings in a quiet world the killer whales that early in september played in the shoal water of our cove not thirty feet from land rolled their huge shining bodies into view plunged raced where we still could follow their gleaming white patch under water that's a thrill the battles that occurred that month between huge fish out in the bay their terrible mysterious black arms that beat the water with a sound like cannon the plunge into the depths of the poor frantic wounded whale and his return again for air again the thunder sound and flying foam and spray as the dread black arm is beating on the sea then calm you shudder at that huge death that was a drama for fox islanders and later the poor magpie's death real tears were shed from a poor boy's half-broken heart two strangers come these days and stop with olson they're on the search of that small craft that we saw driving seaward in a tempest there is a mystery was she adrift unmanned broke from her moorings or was there life aboard as we had thought in that case she'd been stolen and who were the men and where wrecked safely on some island drowned or driven out to sea no man shall ever know a porcupine is captured wandering near our house we build for him a cosy home he doesn't like it much but still he should we care for him day after day he twines himself about our hearts then at last one day when we'd pastured him in freedom out in the new-fallen snow trusting his tracks to lead us to him the goats cut in and spoiled the trail and he was lost to us olson has gone to seward days of waiting days of waiting 
how many times do we travel down the cove to the point from whence Cain's head is seen, going in hope, returning gloomily. The goats beset us, yearning for their missing master. Billy, that maddening beast, eats up one corner of our broom. I throw a heavy armful of kindling wood into his face, and he just sneezes. But Rockwell plays with the goats as if they're human, or rather as if he were a goat. They half believe it, he has told me, and Rockwell, so do I. Sunday, November 3rd. Today was gloriously bright and clear with a strong northwest wind. The mountains are covered with snow, beautiful beyond description. I painted in and out of doors continuously all the day, except when Rockwell and I plied the saw. It is no little thing to have one's work on a day like this, out under such a blue sky, by the foaming green sea and the fairy mountains. Three days go by. It rains and hails and snows, and then is quiet. Over the dead still air comes the roar of pounding seas. Immense and white, they pile on the black cliffs of Cain's head, the wash of a storm at sea. Still over the heavy glassy water we look in vain for Olson. Dark days and the short hours are long with waiting. How many times we traveled down the cove to look toward Seward! How many score of times we peered through the little panes of our west window, never to find the thing we sought for! I've loaded my arms with firewood from the pile. I turn my head, and there in our cove, before my very eyes, at last, is Olson. This is November 6th, nine days away. The war is over, cried Olson as he landed. By all that's holy in life, may the world have found through its mad war at least some fragrance of the peace and freedom that we discovered growing like a flower wild on the borders of the wilderness. Long into night I read the mail, count sweaters, caps, and woolen stockings, all that the mail has brought. It is late, Rockwell is asleep, the room is cold, it snows out of doors and now, instead of bed, I'll stir the fire and begin my work. Thursday, November 7th. A true winter's day, with the snow deep on the ground, and the profound and characteristic winter silence of the out-of-doors, to be sensed even in this ever-silent place. At earliest daylight began a heavy thunderstorm, with lightning all about, and a downpour of hail. It occurred intermittently throughout the morning. I did the washing, using Olson's washboard, and getting the clothes nearly white. Olson is full of amusing gossip. To the curious in Seward, who asked him why I chose to be in this godforsaken spot, he replied, You damn fools, you don't understand an artist at all. Do you suppose Shakespeare wrote his plays with a silly crowd of men and women hanging around him? No, sir. An artist has to be left alone. Well, what does he paint? That's his business. Sometimes I see he has a mountain there on a picture, and next time I see it's been changed to a lake, or something else. One can imagine Olson with his questioners. The thing he most wants, his ambition, one might say, is to make people sit up and take notice of Fox Island, his homestead. It is, in fact, one reason why he brought us here to live. Thanks to its amateur detective, Seward had rejoiced for a short time in rumors of a German spy on Fox Island. I told Olson that the authorities might still come and remove me. He flared up. I'd like to see him try it. We could take to the mountains with guns, and more than one of them would never try the thing again and then he went on to tell me how in Idaho he had tracked for days and weeks a notorious gang of outlaws and horse-thieves, and at last run them to earth, one of his most thrilling, and, I believe, absolutely true stories of his adventures. At this moment a steamer is blowing in the bay, navigating by the echo from the mountain faces. She is near to us now, but hidden by the snowstorm. 
Rockwell has begun to write the story of a long waking dream of his. It's a sweet idea and reads more amusingly in his own queer spelling. Now, though it is already late, I must draw a while longer, and then, after bathing in the bread pan, sit up in bed and read a chapter of the life of Blake. Friday, November 8th. It is so late that I half expect to see the dawn begin. I have been working on a drawing of Rockwell and his father, and it looks ever so fine. Whew! Just at this moment the wind has swept down upon our cabin and blown the roof in as far as it would with great creaking yield, and then passed on, sucking it out in its wake, to such a spread that a board that lay across overhead like a collar beam has fallen with a crash and clatter, and Rockwell sleeps on. The wind does blow to-night, and it doesn't stop outside the walls of the cabin either my lamp flutters annoyingly. But, ah, the room is comfortable and warm. This morning, it being at first wondrously fair, Rockwell and I set out for a boat ride. But what with the fussing of installing our motor and the launching of our cumbersome boat, the wind was given time to rise and spoil the day for us. But we went out into the bay and played in the waves to see what the north wind could do. The chop was devilish short and deep the boat bridged from one crest to another with it seemed a clear tunnel underneath and then running up on to a wave mountain she would jump off its dizzy peak landing with a splash in the valley beyond and dousing us well with water in a calmer spot i stopped the engine and sketched our island after which we rowed home the rest of the day we worked on the motor first to find out why she wouldn't run then having found and fixed that to put other parts in still better order and then by far the longest time and still to continue to-morrow to mend what in the course of our fixings we had broken rockwell's in bed asleep dreaming of the little wild nightingale that sang of freedom to that poor unhappy chinese emperor while far from here in streets and towns the tin nightingale of law made liberty charms the world and it's now my reading time my time for bread and jam and a soft cushioned back the days run by true winter days snow cold and wind what wind it is terrifying when from our mountain tops those fierce blasts sweep upon us roaring as they come flying twigs and ice beat on the roof the boards creak and groan under the wind's weight the lamp flutters moss is driven in and falls upon my work-table the canvas over our bed flaps and then in a moment the wind is gone and the world is still again save for the distant wash of the waves and the far-off forest roar olson is full of treats his latest was in pleasant violation of the law. From a bottle of pale liquid half filled with raisins, he poured me a drink, mixing it with an equal amount of ginger ale and a dash of sugar. It tasted pretty good, quite thrilling, in fact. What is it? I asked. Pure alcohol, he said, smacking his lips. Olson then launched forth on confidential advice from one trapper to another on how to trap men in my case rich patrons he has my need of them quite upon his mind olson's eggs by the way taste good enough they gave him in seward twenty-four dozen bad eggs to bring out for the foxes we have eaten a dozen to-day i cracked seventeen to find six for dinner onion omelet is the fashion to cook them in rockwell pronounces them delicious and well so do i hard hard at work little play not too much sleep the wind blows ceaselessly rockwell is forever good industrious kind and happy he reads now quite freely from any book drawing has become a natural and regular occupation for him almost a recreation for he can draw in both a serious and a humorous vein 
At this moment he's waiting in bed for some music and another Anderson fairy tale. Another day has gone, and a new morning is ours on its way. Out in the moonlit night, strained, tired eyes open wide and are made clear again. Cramped knees must dance in the crisp air. The curved spine bends backward as the outstretched arms describe that superb embracing gesture of the good-night yawn. November the 13th. How time sweeps by! And I look over the black water that we soon must cross again to Seward. The wind bursts around the cabin corner. I shiver and go to bed. End of chapter 4